Well, tonight, I just want to take the next few moments and talk about agreeing with Jesus' assessment of the world. Agreeing with Jesus' assessment of the world. Now, in John 16, verse 1, Jesus makes one of the four statements. There are four statements he makes in John 13 and 17. And John 16, 1 is one of these statements where he tells us the reason why he's giving the instruction that he's given. John 16, 1, he says, These things I have spoken to you that you should not stumble. Now, I believe there are two ways to look at that statement. The first one is to look at it in a general sense that the entire purpose of the instruction of John 13 to 17 is to equip the saints, to equip our hearts, that we would not stumble. So the entirety of John 13 to 17, the purpose is that we would not stumble as believers. The, uh, uh, the phrases before that are John 15 11. He says, these things I've spoken to you that you may have joy and that your joy may remain. And then in John 15, verse 17, he says, these things I command you that you would love one another. And here in John 16, 1, he says, these things I have spoken that you would not stumble. And so these statements, again, they can refer to the entirety of the instruction that Jesus is giving in John 13 to 17. But I believe there's a second uh, way of looking at these phrases, and we're going to look at that tonight, we're going to take that approach tonight, is that right before uh, 16.1, he made several statements. In fact, in John 15, verse 18, to John 15, verse 21, Jesus uh, gives some instruction about the things that will take place, in particular as it pertains to the issue of persecution. And then he says, these things I've told you that you would not stumble. And so tonight, we're just going to take a a brief look at the context of John 16, 1, which really is John 15, verses 18 to verses 21. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the Apostle Paul talks about a, a very serious matter that doesn't get much attention I'm in mean, the church today, one, because it is unsettling, number one, and number two, it, 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 just, it just awakens different kinds of um, uh, theological debates with regards to our salvation. But Paul makes it very clear that one of the things that must happen and that will happen before the Lord returns is that there will be a great falling away, that there will be those who will have named the name of Jesus and I believe those who have had a born-again experience who, because of the pressures of, of life, the pressures in the culture, the pressures in the earth, uh, having lived a lifestyle of continual agreement with darkness in their own souls, find themselves in a position where by the words of their mouth, they decide to break their relationship with the Lord. And they end up in eternal perdition. It's called the great falling away. The book of Hebrews, which we're not talking about the book of Hebrews today, it's a book that is actually filled with warnings about the potential of this dynamic of coming to a place where our hearts have gotten so hardened, where it's not... The, you know, the, because the question is that people say, can you gain or can you lose your salvation? It's not about the losing of salvation as though the Lord takes it away, but you can say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. And he gets that warning all throughout the New Testament in various ways. And I, I realize this uh, kind of a, you know, you're like, man, that's intense. But we got to talk about it because that's what I believe Jesus means in John 16:1. He says, I'm telling you these things so that you would not stumble, that you would not fall away. 
And so I believe that we're at the beginnings of these days. I think we're at the beginnings of the days of this falling away dynamic that is emerging um, in our day, in this generation, in this nation, in the nation of the earth as well, undoubtedly. Many questioning the faith. It's popular these days to go on this journey of I'm deconstructing my faith and all of these different things. It sounds clever. It sounds intellectual. It sounds proper. It sounds smart. It sounds like the thing to do. It sounds reasonable. But it's, it's uh, so much of it is a, again, a subtle drifting away from the faith. I'm not talking about people being Bereans. I'm not talking about searching out the scriptures. I'm not talking about hearing a preacher and going, okay, you know what? I'm going to go to the word of God and I'm going to see if, the, uh, if, if what is spoken or what is taught is true. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the questioning of the authority of scripture. I'm talking about the questioning of the nature and the character of God. I'm talking about the questioning of God's assessment of the human race. I'm talking about the questioning of the fact of whether the cross was in fact necessary for the forgiveness of sin and is Jesus in fact the only way. I'm talking about the real main and plain of Christendom is being questioned by many uh, in the name of, well, I got to, you know, anyway, deconstruct my faith. Anyway, it's, 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 it's a deception It's what it is. And again, so, and this is only the beginnings. It's only going to increase. Now, in the midst of all of that, there, uh, there, the Holy Spirit is moving, and he's going to touch many, and there is coming a great harvest all at the same time. But uh, we're, living in, we're living in some very interesting days. Now, paragraph A, as I mentioned earlier, the, the purpose of John 13 to 17 is to equip his followers. Jesus is seeking to equip his followers uh, to walk in victory under the growing global pressures. To walk in victory in the context of the glowing, growing global pressures. Now, John 13 to 17, I mentioned this before, happens, but it bears repeating, happens about two days after Jesus spoke his message to his disciples in Matthew 24, on the Mount of Olives. Mark chapter 13 is another passage that goes with that, Luke 21, where Jesus describes the unique dynamics that will take place in the generation of the Lord's returns. Um, he, he talks about the Lord's return. He talks about a crisis that is coming and the backdrop of this crisis is its social crisis. He talks about a health crisis. He talks about an emotional crisis, a spiritual crisis. He talks about geopolitical crises. He talks about environmental crises that will happen in the generation of the Lord's return. And yet in the midst of describing this landscape, Jesus says this in Matthew 24, verse 6. He says, see to it that you are not troubled. See to it that you're not troubled. Later on, in a couple of days later, he's having a Passover meal with his disciples, John 13. John 14, verse 1, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And I believe he's picking up the conversation of the exhortation of not having a troubled heart and then he begins to give line upon line instruction of how we can live free from a troubled heart. Because a, a troubled heart is a vulnerable heart. I'll say this again. A troubled heart is a vulnerable heart. It's a heart that is vulnerable to all kinds of things seeking to stabilize itself under pressure. And so Jesus in John 14, even John 15, I, I believe all the way to the end, John 17, he is giving line upon line instruction about how we can relate with God, how we can enter into dialogue with the Godhead, 
and our hearts be filled with peace and joy and keeping us steady under pressure so that we would not stumble, as he says in John 16, verse 1. Paragraph B. Again, Jesus aims to equip the heart to stay steady under pressure. You know, I think of Isaiah 40, verse 31, a familiar passage. Those who wait on the Lord, those who live lives of interacting with the Lord, he says, they will have renewed strength. But the verse right before there, he says, even youth grow tired and weary. Even young men will utterly fall. What, what Isaiah is talking about, he's saying, look, there's, there's coming something in the future that is so intense that even youthful resilience is not robust enough, not strong enough to withstand the pressure. Except for those who uh, seek to cultivate a life of intimacy because there's a vibrancy that happens inside of our hearts. There's a inner fortress that's being built by the presence of God, by the grace of God, of righteousness and peace and joy so we can stand underneath the pressure that is coming. Jesus, he exhorted his disciples two days before that, that the church was not to be troubled, paragraphs B, in light of the unfolding global end-time pressure. Paragraph C, I believe that, again, that the exhortation to not be troubled, that is found in John 14, 1 and John 14, 27, is connected to the call to not be troubled in Matthew 24, verse 6. And what Jesus calls us to, he calls us to a life of joy, a joy that remains under pressure. He calls us to a life of love. He calls us to a life of peace and a life of steadiness in our faith. Paragraph D, a troubled heart is uh, weighed down, is a heart that is weighed down with worry and anxiety. Now, worry and anxiety, uh, beloved, uh, worry is a serious matter. You know, when Jesus says, do not worry, how many of you know that's not a suggestion? When he says, do not worry, he's giving a commandment, which makes worry a sin. It's a, it's a serious matter. Well, you know, then they, they, no, you know, they just like to worry. Well, tell them to stop it. <laughs> well, you know, I just like to worry a little bit. So don't, don't, don't even do that a little bit. Worry is not good. It's a, it actually is a serious matter. I mean, of all the things that Jesus could have said in Matthew 28, excuse me, Matthew 24, he says there'll be wars, rumors of wars. He says there'll be pestilence, disease, earthquakes, nation against nation. I mean, he describes this scenario. And of all the things he could have said, he says, don't worry. He says, do not be troubled. That makes it a serious matter for us to look into. What does a troubled heart do? Paragraph D, it, it hinders the growth of joy and peace in our hearts. It hinders the growth, uh, the experience, the, the cultivating of joy and peace in our hearts. And what happens is when we are weighed down with worry and anxiety, we are now preoccupied with managing our emotions in such a way that it makes it difficult for us to actually step outside of ourselves and give ourselves to the person in front of us in love, which is what love is. It, it creates a, an inward preoccupation, making it difficult to really begin to relate in, really, in real meaningful ways in love in the way that the scripture calls us to love, which really is the, uh, uh, that, that God-given ability by God's grace to give ourselves to another in sacrifice and love. And so worry is a serious matter. 
again, that preoccupies us with the managing of our emotions, to step outside of our feelings, and to step out of our narratives. Because there are, and we'll talk more about that in just a few moments, there are various emotions and there are narratives, perspectives, ideas, and that's why we're talking tonight about agreeing with Jesus' assessment. There are perspectives, there are narratives, there are assessments that we cling on to rather than giving ourselves, being able to give ourselves in love and truth to others. Paragraph E, simply said, worry is simply rooted in pride. Say this again. Simply stated, worry or anxiety is pride. And the reason why it exists is because we have, okay, I, I, I do this every now and then when I you know, speak a heavy message. From now on, I'm talking to me, so y'all don't have to take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it a little better for you. <laughs> but, uh, but worry and anxiety comes about because we actually have, we've actually bought our own press. We've actually bought that exaggerated sense in us having confidence in our human abilities, assessments, and narratives. And worry gets exposed in our hearts when our human limitations in terms of our abilities when we realize that, this, that where our assessments are being challenged in our narratives, our perspective of, a, of ourselves, the person in front of us, the situation, the nation, the world, when situations come and challenge the, the, the frailty of our abilities, the frailty of our assessments, and the frailty of our narratives, that's when anxiety becomes, uh, uh, begins to get stirred up on the inside. Because, in the, because what is happening in these situations, again, paragraph E, the last sentence there, it exposes the assessments and narratives or our mindsets, which the Apostle Paul calls mindsets strongholds. There's a real crazy thing that happens with us as humans. And that is that we actually find safety in our mindsets. It's actually one of the reasons why we don't like changing our minds. We actually find safety in our mindsets. It's why Paul calls them strongholds. These fortresses, these military forts, strongholds, forts, fortresses, they are built for protection, they are built for safety. And what happens in life, there are things that come and they challenge these strongholds, they challenge these mindsets, and we begin to find out very quickly that what happens is that these mindsets or these strongholds were actually straw, uh, they were actually made out of straw. There are these little mud houses and when they and when we get when we begin to see them for what they are we begin to feel unsafe we begin to see feel unsafe which is why the scripture all throughout the old testament says over and over and over again he says no make the lord your fortress make the lord your refuge make the lord your strong tower find your safety in the knowledge of him find your safety when it talks about the Lord being our, 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 our fortress, our stronghold, it means make his presence your safety. Make, um, his, uh, make your intimacy with him your safety. Make his ways, the ways that he wants us to do things, find your safety in doing that. In other words, abandon your assessments, your narratives, and your abilities, and lean into his. That's what it means for the Lord to be our stronghold. Paragraph F, the um, um, worry is our attempt to control the outcome of our lives. Just remember, I'm talking to me. You guys should just listen to some self-talk over here. 
You know, because the bottom line is this, folks. We're all a bunch of control freaks. No, we are. Well, that person a control freak says, well, I don't know. So we really are all control freaks. Some of us have, you know, perfected it to another level. I get that. But, but, uh, but the bottom line is, is that we're all control freaks. We like to control the outcome of our lives, the outcome of our families, the outcome of our friends, and the outcome of this world by leaning on our, again, our abilities, leaning on our assessment. We know exactly what's going on. And leaning on our narratives, we have a, where we cling more to our idea of where this thing is going to go. It has to go there. Rather than leaning into the leadership of Jesus. There's a book called, uh, it's called The Existence and the Attributes of God. It's written back in the 1600s. The author, uh, his name is Stephen Charnock. He wrote about a thousand pages on the subject of the knowledge of God. I call, I call an, um, the existence and attributes, I call it the knowledge of the holy on steroids. Knowledge of the holy is about a hundred pages. Stephen Charnock's book, about a thousand. But he makes this very interesting statement about worry. Here's how he defines worry. He calls it practical atheism. He says that in our worry, we're actually denying the existence of God and making ourselves, again, our abilities, our narratives, and our assessments, they then become the throne of our souls. Let's go to page two. So while we're talking about this, it's because remember Jesus said, that we are uh, not to be troubled. And being troubled has to do, again, when our abilities, our assessments, and our narratives get exposed for the futility and the weakness that they are. <clears throat> and the reason why this is important is because in this context for tonight is that part of the wrestle in the human heart is thinking that our abilities, our assessments, and our narratives concerning the world is the way forward. And it's not. We want to cling to the Lord's power, the Lord's assessment, and the Lord's narrative concerning the world. Paragraph A, over the last several decades, there has been an increase and a growing presence of what the scripture calls another gospel in the body of Christ. And this other gospel, it centers specifically around the nature of God as a righteous judge as well as our nature as sinful humanity. The, the, the two things that this other gospel attacks, again, it's the nature of God as a righteous judge and our nature as sinful humanity, or as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, where before we knew the Lord, that we were by object rebellious children of wrath. That's how Paul describes it. Galatians chapter 1, Paul talks about a different gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, he talks about a different gospel and he talks about another Jesus, a different spirit, not the one that we received at a born again experience. Paragraph B, in John 16, 1, Jesus states the reason why he taught the disciples what he mentioned in John 15, 18 to 27. I said 21 earlier, it's 27. So John 15, 18 to 27 is the instruction that Jesus is referring to in John 16, 1. And 
part of the purpose of the instruction of John 15, 18 to 27 was to help the disciples make sense of the true condition of the world and the context in which they would be a witness. He wanted them to understand the true nature, the true condition of the unbelieving world so they could make sense of what was going on because that would be the context in which the gospel witness would go forth. The second uh, paragraph there in paragraph B, or second sentence, excuse me, not agreeing with heaven's perspective concerning the condition of the world will be a source of stumbling for many. I'll say this again. Not agreeing with heaven's perspective concerning the condition of the world, the condition that we were in before we met Christ, to not agree with heaven's perspective on this will be a source of stumbling, a source of offense for many. Presently, there are growing seeds of this in this generation. Paragraph C, I personally have observed a increased breaking of agreement with the Lord's primary assessment of the human race. From my perspective, I've observed an increasing breaking of agreement with the Lord's assessment of the human race. And here's what it looks like. I've seen it through the increased emphasis on our brokenness rather than our sinfulness. It's very subtle. The increased emphasis on our brokenness rather than our sinfulness. Now, before you run me out of town, there is brokenness. Psalm 147 verse 3 makes it very clear that he, that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Luke 4 18 makes it very clear that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted. So there is this thing called brokenheartedness, but beloved, we are not, the human race is not primarily broken, it is primarily sinful and profoundly evil. And so the increased emphasis on brokenness instead of sinfulness, and here it is, as well as the emphasis on brokenness as the reason for our sinful behavior. I'll say this again. An increased emphasis on brokenness or woundedness or dysfunction rather than our sinfulness, number one. And number two, and then the emphasis on our brokenness dysfunction and woundedness as the reason for our sinfulness. And the problem is this, is that if we are primarily broken, you don't need a savior. You need a therapist. If we're primarily broken, now guess what? Somebody did the breaking. And so the responsibility ultimately always lies in somebody else's behavior towards us. Again, I'm not denying that there's real issues of dysfunction that are tied in to sinful behaviors. It is, in that regard, it's very complex. But the cross was too violent. It was too costly. It was too serious of a thing for 
Jesus to come for merely our woundedness. No, beloved, he paid a price. He, he paid a price for a serious debt that we had with God that we could not repay. And so he made payment for our sins. Mark chapter 10, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his, uh, to give his life as a ransom for many. And so this emphasis or this switching of priorities of brokenness as opposed to sinfulness and that sinful patterns and sinful behaviors are rooted in brokenness. Yes, brokenness are part of our, uh, uh, of our sinful behavior. But beloved, let's just be honest. The, the Bible says some, some pretty intense stuff about our sinfulness and it all but says we kind of do the stuff we do because we want to do them and we, and we like doing them. Paragraph D, it, again, it's true that there's brokenness because of living in a sinful world. It's very real. There are things that have been done against different ones that has caused a tremendous amount of pain and, and it's woven into, again, the dynamic of the sinful patterns. But you know what? Do you know what one of the most, one of the most uh, offensive books in the Bible is? It's the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus is a, is a really intense book because here's why. Because the Lord he delivers slaves. Now think about this. Slaves for 400 years. I mean, the oppression, the cruelty, just all that which comes with it, it's just, it's really, really intense. He delivers them out of Egypt and he gives them the law only to say this, you're just like your slave masters. Again, it's true that there's brokenness and that there's oppression. There's injustice. I wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> and so I get it. But beloved, we have to begin to grapple again with so much of what the scripture has to say. It's very important to recognize that humanity is fundamentally sinful. It's why we need to be born again. It's why we were, Colossians says, we were taken out of the kingdom of darkness and we were brought into the kingdom of light. We were brought into the kingdom of the son of his love. Paragraph E, humanity aside from the work of God's grace is unable and unwilling to receive the gospel. The scripture describes humans not as merely emotionally broken, but as by nature children of wrath, deeply sinful, and evil committed, deeply committed to the value system of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let's look at John, we, we all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, would have everlasting life. But look what it says 
three verses later, verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And look what Jesus says. And men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. It's not just that humans, we did dark things. He goes, no, he goes, they love it. They are committed to it. Which, by the way, it is understanding God's assessment of the human race that makes his grace, his mercy, his love that much more staggering. Absolutely staggering. Paragraph F. The general human perspective is rooted in the idea of the goodness of humanity. Number one. And number two, and that we are positioned to fix the things that are wrong. That is essentially the human perspective of humanity in general, is that humanity is good and that the things that are wrong, we are positioned to fix them. And so therein lies the confidence in our ability to get us out of the mess that we're in. But beloved, this is not consistent with the gospel. The gospel has a different story to tell. It tells us that as humans, we have zero ability to save ourselves. We have no ability to save ourselves at all. Number one, number two, our assessment of the human condition is deeply flawed. I'll say this again. We have no ability to save ourselves. And our assessment of the human race, I'm talking about humanity in general, the general assessment of humanity about humanity is deeply flawed. But some of that assessment has begun to creep into the body of Christ. And so we have a therapeutic gospel. And thirdly, our narrative about the eternal destiny of the wicked is off. And so we have no ability to save ourselves. Our assessment about the human condition is off. And our, and our narrative about the eternal destiny of the wicked is completely off. The lake of fire is very real. Eternal punishment is very real. And people can use all kinds of clever terms, and I, I'm, I, it's not even worthy of repeating what these terms are. The bottom line is, is that, again, that if we are born again tonight because of the gospel. Before we met Christ, the road that we were on was not a good road. Hell is real. Eternal punishment is real. And again, it, it, it conflicts with all kinds of thoughts and ideas about how we think of, again about the nature and character of God, which is why I said earlier that this, that this other gospel, it, it attacks two fundamental things. It attacks the nature of God as a righteous judge, and it, and it attacks the nature of humanity as profoundly sinful, suggesting that we're not sinful, we're broken, and we do messed up stuff, and we just need to get that brokenness dealt with. And that this idea of God being a righteous judge is completely and entirely antiquated. And we're having these discussions and these debates within the body of Christ right now. 
And so Jesus, and he's talking to his disciples, and we'll look at that in just a few moments. In John 15, 18 to 27, he, sa he says, look, he says, let me tell you something about the world that you are about to be ministers in as the, uh, of the gospel. He goes, if you don't, he goes, I'm telling you this because if you don't grab a hold of this, he goes, you will stumble. Because I'm telling you this so you would not stumble. The gospel declares there's only one man, Jesus, who's fully God, who can save the world. The exposure of our wrong narratives, our wrong assessments, and a leaning on our own abilities, it stirs up offense, it stirs up anger, but it also stirs up trouble, it stirs up worry. It's page three. So what was one, so what are some of the things that Jesus said in John 15, 18 to 20? I just want to just look at those two verses. But in verse 18, look what he says. He says, if the world hates you, it's like, oh, like, Lord, can you kind of soften that term? Just dial it down a little bit. He goes, you mean if the world disagrees with you? He goes, no. You no, know, surely you mean if the world doesn't really appreciate what we have to say, he goes, no. Really? Oh, what you're really saying is if the world doesn't like, he goes, no. He goes, they'll hate you. Like, man, that's, those are strong words. He goes, yeah, he goes, I'm telling you this. He said, because if you don't grab a hold of this, he goes, you're, you're going to trip up. He's like, okay, well, I don't want to trip up. He goes, okay, good. He goes, well, then, he goes, then listen. He says, if the world hates you, he goes, you know that it hated me. You're like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean they hated you? I thought the world wanted Jesus, but a church just needs to get it together so that the world can get what the world really wants. And the Lord goes, no. He goes, they don't want me. <laughs> he goes, you didn't want me either until I visited you. You're like, oh, that's true. <laughs> I forgot about that. He goes, I know, that's part of the problem. <laughs> You're like, man. He goes, just remember, they hated me before it hated you. The Verse 19, the world hates you. Verse 20, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. What a statement. Again, he's, he's not just talking about what they will do. Yes, there is a significant escalation of this that will take place at the end of the age. But beloved, this is the condition of the world today. And such were we before we met Christ. There's an interesting verse. I want to point out two verses. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Paul says this, and then we'll look at one more word. He, said, he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Interesting verse. He says, death reigned, or sin reigned from Adam to Moses. One of the things that Paul is saying is that one of the primary messages of the book of Genesis, because that is Adam to Moses, which is the book of Exodus, he says one of the primary messages of the book of Genesis is to convince us that sin had entered into the world. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, here's what he says. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And what he's saying there is that the law, what he means, the, the writings of the law, 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He says, part of the purpose of these books is to awaken us to the condition of the human race that sin had entered into the world. It didn't say from Adam to Moses, brokenness reigned. He didn't say from Adam to Moses, there's woundedness. Now, undoubtedly, there's woundedness. There's, there are passages you can read like, wow, that, ouch, that must have really hurt. But that's not the emphasis that Paul makes. He says, no, death reigned. The theme of sin. He says, the purpose of the law, Romans 3.20, was to make us aware of the fact that there is a problem. And it's the problem of sin. Paragraph A. Throughout history, the nations have been enraged at God's leadership. Now this rage or this anger or this rebellion that's deep-seated, it will reach apocalyptic heights. And the love of darkness in humans will be fully manifest. What Jesus said in John 3, 19, he says, men love darkness. He goes, the scripture tells us that before the Lord returns, it will be fully manifest. Beloved, it's, it's happening today. Now, some of you are a, a little younger to appreciate the perspective, but there are some more experienced individuals in this room, that's my politically correct way of saying older, where there are things talked about today I never thought they would have talked about these things 30 years ago. And not only are they talked about, they could talk about them for hours without repeating themselves. I'm going, where did this thinking come from? I'm like, what is happening? They can actually make sense of nonsense. <laughs> no, it's the craziest thing. And I look back at the scripture and I'm like, wow. He goes, sin really entered into the world. The love of darkness is real. And it's only going to be allowed to come into its fullest expression before the Lord returns. It's a serious matter. The Father loves the world, however. He loves the world with great longing, great desire. In one of my favorite uh, chapters is Psalm 2. It says, you know, why do the nations rage? Why are the nations filled with such anger and rebellion and hatred towards God? The nations. And I can never get over the fact that the nations are enraged against God, Psalm 2, 1. And in Psalm 2, 8, the father says to his son, son, ask me to give you these people as a gift to you. And you go, what is going on over here? Why would the father's inheritance to his son be a people who are enraged against him? It's because the father loves them. He so loved the world and he so sees value in the world in that they were created in the image of God. Image bearers, vessels created to reflect the very character and the nature of God in relationship to one another and entering into a deep relationship with the Trinity. The Father sees the value, so he has great love for the world. And that those who are born again, before the Lord returns, they become his prize. They become his inheritance. 
the best gift a father could ever give him. The father loves the world with great longing, a great desire to the point that he looked his son in the eye and the son agreed. He says, Father, this is great. This is perfect. He goes, yes, I agree. Revelation 13, it says that even before the foundations of the earth, the lamb was slain. In other words, that before the world began, with God the Father, with all of his knowledge, beloved, he knew that when he created the world, this dynamic of sin would enter in, and yet he was compelled by love to create it, to allow it to enter in, knowing that it was going to cost him everything, and sending his son to die for a lost Dying in sinful world. Oh, he loves the world. With great longing, Revelation 1.5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Romans 5, that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now this is love. John says, not that he, not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. And he gave himself as a propitiation, as a price, as a payment for our sins. And so God deeply loves the world, yet he is filled with deep displeasure. Psalm 711, a little obscure verse. Not the one you put on your refrigerator. Pages are probably stuck together right there. <laughs> Psalm 711. You know what it says? Here's what it says. Ready for this? God is angry with the wicked every day. And yet John 3.16 and God's deep displeasure with the world, they, they, they actually can coexist. Paragraph B, John 15, verses 18 to 27, Jesus uh, connects the disciples with the truth that's prophesied by King David in Psalm 2. That's what's happening. In John 15, 18 to 21, he's connecting the disciples with the truth of Psalm 2, that the nations will rage against the gospel and they will be plotting to remove the influence of the gospel and the influence of the church. Psalm 2 is filled with a very powerful paradox where we see God's posture towards a resistant world, his deep displeasure towards them, and yet his plan to give those nations as an inheritance to his son. Paragraph C, the rage of the nations is seen in various ways. Acts chapter 4, verses 28 to 31, the, the church, they are in prayer, and they quote Psalm 2 in connection to the crucifixion of Jesus. And so the, the rage of the nations, though in Isaiah 53, God uh, was directly involved in uh, the crucifixion of Christ, but here in Psalm, uh, the, the early church tells us that it was the rage of the nations that was involved in it as well. Secondly, the rage of the nations against Christ is also seen in the persecution of the church throughout history, even today. I think the number is uh, 150,000 a year to get martyred for the gospel in the earth. Thirdly, the rage of the nations is seen in Babylon. There, there will come a global increase of this hatred, this rage. John described it, that it was so intense that it says that they were drunk with the blood of the martyrs. Meaning 
it was so rampant in the culture that people began to lose their, their sense of reality because of the bloodthirstiness of the culture. Fourthly, the race of the nation seen through the Antichrist against the end time church. The prophet Daniel and the apostle John said it this way, paragraph D. Daniel and John both described the plot of the nations, the, the strategizing of the nation, as beloved, as a all-out war against the church. I mean, the full manifestation of this rage at the end of the age will be described as an all-out war against the church and against the gospel. Paragraph E, the nation's rage will manifest at the end when government leaders ratify legislation seeking, here it is, through strategic state-sponsored violence to destroy the church. And John 16, 1, <laughs> Jesus says this. He goes, I'm telling you this so that you don't trip up. Let's go to page four. We're almost done. She, then you can go get a burger or something. <laughs> this makes me, I'm uncomfortable saying these things. <laughs> no, I really am. I was like, ah, this is unsettling. It, it, my stomach hurts. No, for real. I'm like, ah, like, Lord, Really? And like, yeah, I'm like, man. I was getting ready for this. I'm looking at this. I go, Lord, I go, I don't know. He goes, no. He goes, if you don't say these things, people will stumble. I'm like, yeah, I know, but. <sighs> okay. Well, paragraph A. Jesus wants us to know the true condition of the world. So that we can relate, number one, properly to unbelievers as a loving witness. He wants us to know the true condition of the world so that we can relate with the world's loving. By the way, don't go to your, don't get on the phone and call your unbelieving friends and family and say, do you know you're, you're a bunch of God haters? No, no, don't do that. <laughs> this is, this is for our understanding so we know what it is that we're dealing with so we know how to, number one, relate properly in love with an unbelieving world. And number two, so that we can understand and properly interpret the things that are happening around us in the culture. The very fact that we are shocked at the things that are happening in the culture is a reflection that we have not bought into the Lord's assessment of the world. And so we go, if we can just get, man, if we can just get the right guy in office, which I'm all for that, but we can just, it's one thing to get a right guy in office so you can bring some restraint. It's a whole other thing to get a right guy in office thinking it's going to remove all of this mess. It is not going to remove it. Paragraph B. Again, in John 15, 18 to 21, Jesus is emphasizing something that is significantly underemphasized, which again is the condition of depravity of the unbelieving world. Beloved, if we're not careful, a slow but growing perception will take root. And here it is it is a perception that suggests that unbelievers want Jesus if we would only 
package the thing just right. For years, I've heard this said, and it's a, it's a famous quote from uh, Gandhi. He said, I like your Christ, but not your Christianity. And, and this quote was often used to make the point about how messed up the church is. Uh, granted, we're deeply flawed, and there's a lot that the Lord wants to do and is going to do with his church to become that effective witness that we're called to be. But here's the stink of it all. Jesus seems to say that the more effective the witness, it is actually going to manifest their hatred. And in the way of thinking, the suggestion is if the witness is effective, then we'll win the whole world. And that's not true. Yes, there's coming in a great harvest. There's coming a great end time revival. The prophets make it very clear, Joel in particular, there's coming an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like never before in the generation which the Lord returns. In the midst of a significant eschatological hostility and rage that will manifest in the nations. And yet there's this perception that suggests that unbelievers want Jesus, and if we're not careful, we're going to grab a hold of that perception, meaning that if we just package it just right, they will come in. The fact is, Gandhi didn't like Christ. Or he would have responded to Christ. Maybe he did, and we don't know. Ultimately, we don't know. But there's no record in history that says that he followed Jesus, whom he claimed to like. Yes, again, the church needs significant adjustments, and the Lord wants an accurate witness of truth, both in message and in life. However, this belief that Christianity is in general the problem has created an implied belief that people want Jesus. And John said this in John 1, 10, 11. He says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. To identify the world primarily through the lens of brokenness instead of deeply sinful will produce a friendship with the world that is going to further hinder and dilute the gospel witness. And by friendship with the world, I don't mean relational. Only way that we can be a witness and to share in the gospel is by being in relationship with those who don't know the Lord. I'm not talking about being in relationship with them and, and being kind and loving and considerate and all the things that we are to be as Christians. I'm not talking about that. Friendship with the world is referring to agreeing with their value system. So again, so to primarily identify the world as broken, is that a deeply sinful, is to produce a friendship with the world. It's to produce a context of deep agreement with the world. Thus hindering and diluting the gospel witness. This friendship is embracing the world's value system concerning the human condition. And James said that friendship with the world or an agreement with the world system. He says that's enmity with God. I mean, I mean, look at that. Isn't that interesting that he, he goes, you know, he goes, if you are friends with them, he goes, then you are in opposition to me. He goes, because they are in opposition to me. John 15, 19, Jesus says something very intense. He goes, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. It's like, man, that's unsettling. So the worship team come up. The seeker-sensitive messaging and the like are setting up believers to stumble greatly. Greatly. 
when faced with the hatred of the culture of the earth. A wrong message of the condition of the unbelieving world combined with a therapeutic gospel will cause many to give themselves and to endear themselves to the world more, wanting to win them over. But it will be a slippery slope to apostasy. Again, this wrong message, this therapeutic gospel, it will cause many to endear themselves to the world because what happens is you present Jesus, they get mad, and then the conclusion is, oh, I must be wrong in what I said. I've got to continue to adjust my witness and my message until they are angry no more. Because after all, they want Jesus. My message is just messed up. And that's why Jesus says, we got to be clear about the condition of the world. He goes, I told you these things, John 16, 1, that you may not stumble. Father, Lord, we ask you that you would, uh, would rest on our hearts, on our minds. Lord, give us wisdom, give us insight. Father, return us to the simplicity of Christ, Christ revealed in us, and the simplicity, the authority of your words. 